you look carefully at the Four Noble Truths, you begin to realize that the Buddha was a very strategic thinker. He takes elements out of the first two Noble Truths, suffering and the cause of suffering, and he puts them to use in the path to the end of suffering. Remember that suffering, he said, when you boil it down to its essence, is five clinging aggregates – form, feeling, perception, <coughs> fabrications, and consciousness – as they are clung to. And the cause of suffering is craving, specifically craving for sensuality, craving for becoming, craving for not becoming. And so in order to abandon the cause of suffering and understand suffering, you take some of those elements out of those two noble truths and you plug them into the fourth noble truth, the path to the end of suffering. In other words, you learn how to use the aggregates in a way that helps pry loose the, the clinging part, and you learn how to use craving for becoming. in a way that eventually gets you beyond becoming. For instance, when you practice concentration, you've got all five aggregates here. You've got form, which is the form of the body, the breath, and you've got feeling. The feelings of pleasure and pain in the body, which you're trying with the breath to turn into more feelings of pleasure. There's the perception of the breath. There's fabrications, in other words, directed thought and evaluation, verbal fabrication. And then there's finally consciousness of all this. So you've got the aggregates here, and you're going to cling to them for a while. It's not that you strip them free of clinging right away. You're going to want to hold on to the state of concentration that you develop out of learning how to deal with the aggregate skillfully. And as for craving, craving for becoming, the state of concentration is a state of becoming, something that you bring into being. And then you try to maintain. And there has to be craving to do this. The difference here is that you learn how to use these things in a skillful way. And John Fuing used to say there are three steps in meditation. One is learning how to do it, second is learning how to maintain it, and the third is learning how to put it to use. And there's a certain amount of discernment involved in all three steps, but in the putting to use is when it requires a lot of skill. For instance, in concentration, you've got Actually, there are three kinds of fabrication involved. The in and out breath is actually called bodily fabrication, and then your directed thoughts and evaluation around the breath, when you keep reminding yourself to think about the breath and the way you evaluate the breath, that's called verbal fabrication, because that's how we create sentences in the mind. And there are finally the feelings of pleasure that develop around that, and then we maintain that perception of breath. So you've got all forms of fabrication right here. And you learn how to manipulate them skillfully. And once you learn how to manipulate them skillfully while you're sitting here on your meditation cushion, you begin to realize you can manipulate them skillfully in other ways as well. When you're out off the cushion, you can learn how to manipulate these things as well. Say you're dealing in a difficult situation. It's good to be able to stay in touch with the breath. Say when anger arises, notice where in the body the breath energy starts getting strange, where it gets tense or tight in different parts of the body. Can you breathe through the tension? Can you breathe through the tightness? 
You breathe in in such a way that you stay relaxed all the way through the in-breath, all the way through the out, in the midst of whatever is happening. That makes it easier not to keep the anger bottled up. so that you're not carrying it around. And pressure doesn't build up inside so you feel like you're going to explode. As for directed thought and evaluation, then look at the situation. Okay, what is about the situation that makes you angry? How are you thinking about it? What are the terms you bring to it? Many times the people we're most angry at are the ones we also feel the most affection for. So it's useful to remind yourself, well, why do you feel affection for that person? They must have some good to them. Why focus on their bad points all the time? Remind yourself there is, you've got to take the good with the bad when you're dealing with people. As John Sawat said, it, it once said, it's like buying durian. Durian is a very thick rind. And when they weigh the durian, they weigh the rind along with the durian fruit inside. You're not going to eat the rind, but you have to pay for the rind. That's the way they weigh durian all over Thailand. There's no way you're going to buy just the fruit. If you take it out of the rind, they charge you a lot extra for the fruit, and then the fruit itself is going to spoil early. So the rind does serve some purpose, but you've got to take the rind with the fruit. And it's the same with people. You've got to take the, the bad with the good. So remind yourself, this is the way people are all over the world. If you want to associate only with really good people, well, you're born in the wrong, wrong world. So you learn to think in this way. That helps to pry loose a lot of the, the clinging to the anger. So it's not that you drop verbal fabrication entirely. You just learn how to use it more skillfully. The same with your feelings and perceptions. The perception here is, again, like the, the durian example. The Buddha thinks <clears throat> the Buddha teaches a lot in terms of similes, to give you a good simile to think about things. If you're angry at somebody and all you can think of is how much they've harmed you, he reminds you to remind yourself that okay, when you're going through this world, he says you're like a person who's hot, tired, and thirsty, and you need water. And if you think of other people's bad points all the time, it's like taking fire and sticking it in your mouth. What you need is the water. Think about their good things, even there's only just a little bit. He gives the example of someone walking along in the desert. And they come across cow footprints, and there's a little bit of little puddles of water in the cow footprints. And you realize that if you tried to use your hand to scoop the water out of the footprint, you'd muddy the water and make it unfit to drink. So you have to get down and very carefully just slurp up the water. It may not look very dignified, but you're thirsty, you're hot, you're trembling, you need water. And as we go through the world, we have to. Focus on other people's good points, because if you, all you do is focus on their bad points, you start wondering, well, why should I be good? We live in this miserable world where there's nothing but greedy people fighting each other all the time. And if that's all you see, then you start being greedy and fighting people all the time, too. And where does that leave you? Other people's goodness is nourishment. Their bad points are fire and the poison. So why try to feed on them? Try to feed on the good points. You need them. Think in terms of that simile. It makes it a lot easier to let go of your anger and to be forgiving of other people. Or you may find yourself in a situation where suddenly you're being asked to do a lot more than you would like to do or than you think you can handle. And you can ask yourself, this image I have of myself being able only to handle so much, is it accurate or is it just part of a story that I've made up to place limitations on myself? 
limitations on the expectations I have for myself, limitations on the expectations I want other people to have about me. And to what extent is that story a useful story? If you're faced with a situation, like we were saying last night, if you're a soldier, you decide that you want to take a certain hill. You think that when you take that hill, then you're going to be able to rest where you get up to the hill and you find oh, it's even worse than you thought. A lot more soldiers on the other side. And they're attacking you just as you're feeling weakest. And you can't tell them, well, in my image of this battle, taking the hill was going to be victory. So you guys have got to stop. Wait till tomorrow morning until I've rested and then we can have our battle. It doesn't work that way. So what you've got to do is frame a new story in which you're able to handle this, that you're able to find unexpected resources inside yourself that you can draw on when you really need them. So what you're doing is you're taking these fabrications, which you ordinarily cling to in a way that causes suffering, and learn how to use them in a new way. A much more skillful way, a way that can help lead to the end of suffering. Not only while you're sitting here and with your eyes closed where everything is very peaceful, but in the rough and tumble of your everyday interactions with other people. So learn how to think strategically. Take these things that you've been using to cause suffering, and you can use them in a different way. Desire has its good side. The aggregates have their uses. And if you learn to think in this way, you, your discernment develops in unexpected ways. Ways that are helpful in all kinds of situations. As a John Lee once said, if you have discernment, you can use anything to a good purpose. You've got this body. Well, use your body for a good purpose. You've got feelings, perceptions, thought fabrications, and consciousness. You can learn how to use them all for a good purpose. In that way, everything becomes the path.